loves, God loves, all that God loves Think about, think about that Think about it like we have an obligation, our first obligation as Christians is to tell the truth. Tell the truth. And we need we need to tell the truth about the past. And Craig and I, when we were storyboarding and mm -hmm. talking about telling the story, I said, Craig, I want to go between sort of statue toppling cancel culture and whitewashing. We right. have to go because in the middle is simply telling the truth. We simply need to tell the truth, and that's all you need to do is tell the truth. And um, and I think there's so much redemptive in realizing, okay, the iniquity of the slave system, what Newton was involved in, and then seeing him change, but not right away. And then when he does see it, he then acts. Historically speaking, a way station is a rest stop for weary pilgrims at the end of their day of travel. It's a safe place to get a meal, to replenish supplies and rest up before the next day's journey. It's an opportunity to enjoy the company of others, to get news from other lands, and to exchange ideas. Waystation's podcast allows me to share with you some of the people I meet on my many travels. Authors, artists, theologians, activists, people that think differently than me, who have perspectives I wouldn't come to on my own, and who enrich my vision and appreciation for the complexities that make life the wonder and challenge that it is. Thanks for joining me. My name is Steve Bell, and this is Waystation's podcast. Hi, everyone. This is episode three of Waystation's podcast. Welcome. Um, this is my opportunity to share with you some of the wonderful people I meet on my journeys and my my life is rather rich with wonderful people. And today's guest is no exception, Bruce Hindmarsh. And you might recognize him from a podcast we did last year about St. John of the Cross and my rendition of St. John's Dark Night of the Soul. Bruce is a professor of spiritual theology and the history of Christianity at Regent College in Vancouver, BC. He's a scholar of early evangelicalism, which includes a legacy of folks like John and Charles Wesley, Richard Wilberforce, and characters like John Newton. Uh, the infamous slave trader who wrote the song Amazing Grace. About a month ago, I received a copy of Bruce's new book, The Life of John Newton and the Surprising Story Behind His Song. Now, Bruce wrote the book with Craig Borlase, who helped take the considerable historical work Bruce has done on John Newton and turned it into a dramatic biography, which reads more like a novel than a history book. So let me read you a brief summation. Uh, Newton's story is shocking. An amazing grace does not try to airbrush or excuse his faults. There are glaring contradictions in the life of a ship's captain who retreats to his cabin to study his Bible and write tender love letters to his wife while hundreds of slaves lie in chains in the hold below. <laughs> and the book is a page turner for sure. I've, I've already read it a couple of times. Uh, but there's a, a very important contemporaneous to Newton's story which the authors skillfully bring out. So here's my recent conversation with Bruce about the book. And uh, please stick around for a song at the end. Hello, Bruce. How are you doing? Very good. Good to see you, Steve. <laughs> good to see you too. Hey, listen. I, um, I've already I've already introduced you and 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 the book and all that. I got this book of yours in the mail. Gosh, um, about a month ago or maybe a bit more. Yeah. We obviously haven't talked in a while because if no. if I knew you were even writing this, I had forgotten. So yeah. I got it from the publisher, and here's this book. And the, Bruce, oh, I know him. Oh my goodness! Um, and I've yeah. in the last month I've read it twice. I just finished reading it for the oh, second wow. time this morning. It's what a well, great you. book. Yeah. Um, you you've had a keen interest in in John Newton for some time. So where where yeah. did that start, and why? Yeah, well, it's interesting. It's over thirty years ago, Steve, when I was doing my doctoral work at Oxford, that I I came to focus in on John Newton, and um, and went sort of did a deep dive into archival materials and uh, letters and so on. And uh, my kids used to say that uh, their dad for a living reads dead people's mail. That's what I do, <laughs> you know. And um, but so it, it was my Oxford uh, doctoral thesis. But I focused in on John Newton's life and ministry as a major figure in the evangelical revival and the origins of evangelicalism. And I kind of didn't do the stuff very much that he was most, in a sense, famous or infamous for, you know, his involvement in the slave trade earlier, his relationship with the troubled poet William Cooper, and his involvement in abolition. I kind of focused on his theology, his life as a pastor, and all the rest of it. So 30 years later, 
um, it's the 250 year anniversary of the hymn Amazing Grace. And there's an opportunity and I'm thinking, do I go back in a sense into the archives and uh, sort of deal with the mental scar tissue of all these years and go back and think through uh, the life of John Newton once more. And I, I kind of thought there was an opportunity uh, to tell the story again, because there's been inspirational biographies of various sorts. Mm -hmm. There's not yet a, a what we call a critical biography of John Newton. But I thought here's an opportunity to tell the story of grace and redemption for another generation, not least because these are times when we're polarized and when um, when maybe the message of grace and mercy uh, can be heard once more. So there was an opportunity mm. to tell it for a general audience. And then um, my friend Craig Borlay is my new friend. Um, mm. uh, we wrote together, and I've never co-authored yeah. a book before, but this was a lot of fun. Well, yeah, and this is, uh, and just for the readers, this is, it's, it's uh, what do you call it, a dramatic biography. So can yeah, you just tell yeah. us what that is? Yeah, this was a big decision for me because normally I write a book every 10 years and I, I can't write, you know, more than half a sentence without a footnote. Right. And, um, and so I was kind of pushed because Craig, I mean, Craig is a, like New York Times bestseller author. He writes a lot of memoirs and, uh, and he writes with great fluency. And a friend put us together, thought this was a project that needed to be done, a friend who'd written with Craig before. And so Craig flew over, it's during COVID, and he comes and stays with us at our house for a weekend. And uh, we go for a walk in the Pacific Spirit Forest um, outside uh, sort of, uh, you know, UBC. And mm -hmm. uh, we really bonded, and it was like a heart connection. And I just felt like I can entrust myself to this person, whatever happens. I mean, it's a bit like you, you and I, Steve. We work together and yeah. talk together, and and you must have wondered, can I trust this guy? What will this be like? Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You don't want to be caught in a situation where you have to yeah. be backpedaling, you know. And yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so we kind of worked out. We kind of storyboarded. And, um, you know, what's the story here? And Craig has a great eye for, for storytelling. And, um, and then we kind of went away and Craig lives in England. And so we're writing sort of eight hours apart. And mm -hmm. it's like, I can sous chef materials for him. He can cook a little bit and then send something back for me to adjust the recipe. And we could kind of write back and forth. But then in January, he came over again and he, he, and what we had to work out is this question of, um, uh, what 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 is a, a more dramatic biography and so um we wanted to it, it's like based on a true story it's like front row for theater a show don't tell we wanted it to be accessible and immersive but we needed conventions because there'd been a biography written in 1961 by a great canadian uh, grace irwin and it was entirely kind of historical fiction, but it was right. unclear what was real and what was made up. And right. in fact, s several names that she gave to, um, to to figures and to boats and so on made it into the historical record. People didn't know <laughs> that um, that these were fictional. So Craig and I came up with conventions about you know all the proper names, the chronology, and so on being exact. And we used it's a bit like Ignatian meditation. Uh, on, on scripture where you're not trying to imagine uh make stuff up but you're trying to see it you're trying to see it mm -hmm. and and as real as it really was and so it really challenged me as a historian because i realized uh one of the first you know pages that craig wrote he writes about you know the six-year-old john newton mm -hmm. shining his knee buckles and i thought great now i have to find out whether in um <laughs> 1742 or whatever it was that uh, are they there knee, knee buckles, buckles that join right. that join your breeches to your yellow stockings right. but i realized i hadn't fully imagined my figures in their context to see to hear to touch to feel and so craig really helped me be a better historian and so we imagined our way so some of the dialogue is invented but mm -hmm. it's not invented to make stuff up it's where John Newton says, you know, I was often in fear of my father uh, when before him. We recreated some plausible dialogue between him and his mm -hmm. father that we hope will lead the reader to say, ah, John Newton was in fear of his father, you know. Right. And so, but we try to make it, I think it's pretty clear with the notes at the end and so on, sort of, you know, where the lines are. 
Uh, but yeah, you're you're, you're quite clear in those notes. You're you're yeah. quite clear. I yeah. actually in, like after every chapter, I'd kind of go back and try to figure, yeah. okay, what were they? What yeah. was the imagination part here? Yeah. I think you know, my our friend Malcolm Geit would love this. Like he, you know, he oh, really good. does yeah. talk yeah. about yeah. how how yeah. the imagination is key to knowledge. Yeah, um, and and we yeah. think of imagination as almost being a separate thing than knowledge. Yeah, or fanciful yeah. But it is, or it is yeah. an organ of truth, as yeah. uh, Coleridge. Um, says and uh yeah. yeah no very much so and i this was an interesting project and um, i've also been working with some folks on a film project that will be uh, um and it's the same sort of thing steve where um the guys that are you know uh, filming the kind of storm scenes in san diego you know i'm in the middle of an academic meeting in san antonio and they're texting me <laughs> would the captain be wearing a wig you know during the <laughs> storm and i'm going the captain probably maybe not the crew but it would be a bob wig not a tie wig you know and i'm having oh to actually goodness. be and imagine you know or that the hole on the side of the ship must have been on the starboard side side because they were being um pushed north off of their course right and in all sorts of ways you know i actually feel like i i've seen the story in my imagination but hopefully i've seen something sort of even more true and accurate than i might have um when i'm just thinking about you know John Cal calvinism yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know it really is compa i mean just say for you know i i, I would definitely recommend it. it's 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 it reads like a like a story and it yeah. it flows like a story and um it's quite enjoyable as a straight read it's a fun read yeah. And yeah. it's easy. It's easy yeah. to put a lot of time in it. It, it moves oh, pretty good. quick. You, yeah. you kind of want to. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's really really nice. But then also, I mean, it, it's it's clear from the book and how you guys tell it that you are, you you are trying to sort of lay this over a little bit our contemporary history and help us find yeah. meaning in our yeah. own story yeah. at this point. So yeah. we'll get to that in a minute. Um, yeah. Can you can you tell us uh, just for those that don't know the general story of, sure. of, of sure. Newton? Just give us give give us an idea what's what that is sure um so john newton lived in the 18th century 250 years ago and um he had quite a dramatic uh, life story he's the author of the hymn amazing grace he wrote it when he was um you know um about sort of 48 mm -hmm. years of age sort of um at that point in his life when he is a minister a parish uh, priest, uh, 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 evangelical minister in a little market town north of London called Olney. And he wrote it for a New Year's Eve service and to help his congregation look back and look forward over their lives. And at that point, his life looks um, um, fairly uh, stable and uh, predictable. But if anybody had known sort of dangers, toils and snares in his sort of prior life, it had been John Newton. In fact, he had an autobiography that came out shortly after he became a minister in this parish. And he said, after people read it, they looked at him in the street. They're looking at him, um, being aware of what he'd been through. So as a child, he's born in London. He's born in uh, Wapping, which is sort of East London and the area where a lot of sailors and uh, people who worked in the maritime uh, sort of trade, which is huge at this point in the first British Empire, lived. And uh, he learns the hymns of Isaac Watts from his mother, who's a godly uh, dissenter, a kind of uh, independent uh, congregationalist. Um, his mother dies when he is six years of age, just almost seven. It's the first great sort of trauma in his life. And his father is away at sea. So picture a young boy uh, all alone in the world. Mm -hmm. And then um, he doesn't really fit into his, his father remarries. He doesn't fit into this new step family very well. And his father as a figure, you know, is kind of severe and distant, yep. like he's always in command. And he is the, 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 the you know, ship captain in every sense of the word. And so, um, but, uh, you know, he had some difficult experiences at boarding school, some difficult teenage years. But he's beginning <laughs> to drift away from his young, his, his, his faith. And uh, he tries to live up to the standards that his mother had taught him and he finds that he fails. And so he has that kind of cycle as an adolescent. His father takes him on a few uh, voyages mm -hmm. in the uh, Mediterranean. Um, and he's uh, uh, developing some bad habits, um, but he is uh, being trained up to be, you know, in the merchant Marine. And then one day, you know, as an 18 year old um, around 
sort of uh, 18 years of age. He uh, war is threatening with France, and he is wearing probably his uh, Czech sailor shirt, walking near the Thames, a little bit careless, because uh, you, the Navy was able to legally kidnap people to impress them into the Navy, uh, to, to capture them and use them in the Navy if they were sort of uh, unattached. I, I, I found so, that stunning part yeah. of the story. I didn't know that was a thing. You could just they could legally just take you off the street and and there's nobody could yeah. help you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the life in the Navy was could be pretty brutal. And yeah. so I think that's the second great sort of trauma. There's sort of a trauma in his childhood. There's a trauma yeah. in his adolescence. And meanwhile, he has fallen punch drunk in love with this young woman named Mary Catlett. Polly. And um Polly. Yeah, yep. Polly was her nickname. And um, and going through the story again, realized that three times in a row, it happened to be in December, he is visiting the Catlett family, and three times in a row, he cannot tear himself away. And uh, all three times, he gets into trouble with adults for plans that they have for his life. The last time is when he was on leave, um, on shore leave in the Navy, having been impressed on a naval ship that sees action in the North Sea, but it's near Kent and he has leave and he goes to visit the family, he comes back and really he was AWOL. He was absent without leave. And he does this kind of thing time and again. He loves a Mary Catlett and he wants to marry her and he has um, he is infatuated with her. And one of the things Craig noticed as um as he wrote sort of you know with the heart and thought this through is uh he had a sense that that you know john newton in a sense fell in love with the whole family that this yeah. is the family where his that mother had died that that really came across in the book that yeah it was yeah. it was a deep Polly absolutely he was smitten yeah. by her clearly but there was a there was a hospitality and a, there was a home there for him that warmth. felt more yeah and warmth that he didn't get from obviously from his stepmom and his and his his brusque father, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So here he is on this naval ship now, and um, they're they're trying to find, you know, everybody's anticipating what's the, going to be their orders for the ship. And uh, they're going to be sent to the East Indies. It's going to be like a five-year tour of duty. And he is desperate. He thinks this is absolutely terrible because Polly will probably meet somebody else, get married. That's all he can think about. And um, so they're in Plymouth, getting uh um you know ready to 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 leave on this this long voyage he um he had been promoted to midshipman through his father's influence it was kind of like a junior officer so it wasn't too bad uh conditions mm -hmm. on board the ship compared to what it could be being a common sailor before the mast as they say but he um he goes on shore to get some supplies and uh for the ship and he goes awol and he leaves and he just marches away and starts walking away from Plymouth, thinking maybe his father could make arrangements for him. And instead he is recaptured, taken on board in chains. And I mean, he could have been, he could have been um, executed. Uh, I mean, this was a, this was a very serious um, sort of crime he had committed. Well, well the, and the, yeah. the, 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 the book, like his whole impetuousness, like he just, he would just yeah. like, not like yeah. what, never deliberate, right? That's his yeah. sort that of was his motto. motto. Yeah, or as we might deliberate. say today about teenagers, you know, he had not yet grown a prefrontal cortex, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he yeah. never never checked. He just impulsive, right? Absolutely yeah, very impulsive. dangerously so. Yeah. 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 And uh, and you wonder sort of where that comes from because he, uh, this was characteristic. He just did stuff without thinking. Yeah. And, um, and so he is whipped with a cat of nine tails, which have been absolutely brutal. He is stripped of his rank. He has put before the mast with the common sailors that he had previously been lording it over. And the ship is leaving now for this five years. He he is looking over the gunnels of the ship as the coastline of England is receding. And he had pretty dark thoughts of he really a murder suicide that he would kill the captain and kill himself. That's how dark this kind of moment is. And so um, in a way, I, I think back on his life, Steve, and I think, you know, we need grace sometimes because of awful things that happen to us, right? right? And then we, more deeply and more painfully is when we realize we need grace because of the things that we've done or we've been complicit in. And he's sort of heading into a kind of descent and into a breaking because the ship is uh, is leaving um, by a kind of, um, 
um, uh, and there was a, a, a kind of a unique opportunity that came up where he ended up getting out of the Navy. He was desperate to get out of the Navy. He got transferred and traded. This sometimes right. happened into a merchant marine ship. But really, as we look at it, we can see as he's descending the ladder into a ship, getting out of the Navy, he is descending into the belly of the beast because this is where he is literally descending into and being a part of the transatlantic slave system because it's a slaver it's a slave ship on off the west right. coast of africa and that's the beginning of his involvement for a number of years in the slave trade mm -hmm. but he will uh, trade a little bit uh you know with this ship he's a ship steward but then again impulsively without making arrangements as an apprentice or anything he joins a man named evans who is setting up what they called a factory, which is really a kind of warehouse off the west coast of Africa. He's setting up a warehouse on Plantain Island, and he thinks maybe he could make his fortune or make some money, or he could, you know, he could get off the ship and work in the onshore slave trade. Instead, um, and this is a kind of breaking point for him, he he's malarial, uh, tropical disease, almost certainly malaria. He... Um, uh, he, the, the princess of the Bullum people, P.I., she was called, right. who was, uh, um, married to, 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 to Evans and kind of really, really ran the show there. She did not like him and he ended up abused. He ended up imprisoned. He ended up in chains, uh, near starvation. Like and an really animal. Was, Is this, yeah, it was like an animal. Yeah. 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 And, uh, so early twenties, far from home should have died um, unloved and uh, broken. And he often looked back on this as a kind of a, a low point in his life. He ends up rescued and uh, his father, you know, um, regardless of how he thought of his father, his father looked out for him and uh, asked people, you know, uh, ship captains to keep an eye out for his son. There was a ship called the Greyhound that was not trading for slaves. And uh, Captain Gother uh, called in the west coast of Africa and found Newton and convinced him to come on board the ship. And this ship was making a huge uh, voyage down into equatorial waters um, in um, uh, sort of further south in Africa, and then made a huge arcing voyage sort of past the coast of Brazil. It would follow the trade winds and the currents to pass the coast of Brazil through the Caribbean, uh, all of this without stopping off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. And then in 1748 is making its way back across the Atlantic towards Ireland when they encounter a severe North Atlantic storm on March 21st. And um, in the middle of the night, Newton is awakened and uh, a man is swept overboard and they are pumping fiercely to try to keep this ship from sinking and uh, it's sustaining damage. And it's in the midst of this, it's not quite a... a a prayer but he just finds himself he says there's signs that you know his conscience was troubling him there's signs you know he'd begun reading some religious books but then he closed them and thought there's no hope for me mm -hmm. i've made my choice but during the storm um he said if this will not do then the lord have mercy in other words if we can't figure out how to keep the ship afloat then the lord have mercy and then he stopped and he goes well how can there be mercy for me who am I? And I think this is the point at which um, mm. the 18th century language would be his conscience was awakened. Right. And all the agonies of a repressed conscience came back. And he finds himself in the middle of the night thinking, how could there be mercy for somebody like me when I think of what I've done and who I've been? And this is not kind of his conversion. And in fact, he would say that grace mm. dawned very slowly in his life. It wasn't just like you know, one and done and then even though it's a made for television event um this kind of dramatic storm they survived the storm and uh and, by and, the time but, but i just i'd like yeah. to just almost uh, underline that that his conversion yeah. really was a lifetime it yeah. it it wasn't yeah. one and done like and cuz i, I kind of grew up in the one and done model you know yeah, um, yeah. so you get oh, saved you try not to important. blow it yeah but his yeah. his was a and, lifetime of being saved eh yeah yeah and there's a version of the story that is sort of, you know, Newton had this foxhole conversion, sort of, you know, he had this uh, near-death experience. He turned to Christ and he wrote Amazing Grace. That's not the story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not the yeah. story. And, yeah. it's, and he knew that was not the story. 
And uh, he looked back and he was at pains to say, this wasn't like a V-shaped conversion. He, he felt like it's more like um, the sun comes up very slowly. You're not exactly sure, you know, when, when, when the, the light is slowly kind of filling mm -hmm. the air and, um, and uh, that it was, it was a slow dawning for him. So he, um, he ends up, the ship makes it, you know, barely. Uh, they they nearly starved at sea and uh, died of thirst and uh, but they the ship makes it back to Ireland and and in in the language of the time he said I was no longer an infidel and by what that that means so like I'm not an agnostic I'm not a free thinker oh, right. I'm not an atheist I kind of have faith and I think I I need to do better I need to do better um, I need to I need to be more observant right um, he ends up being first mate on a slave ship and and for a number of years now he's going to do this transatlantic um uh slave trading he's a uh, first mate on a slave ship and he said within six months back at plantain island the same place where he had been yeah. in servitude he again near death malarial a fever he crawls to an isolated spot on the island and that's where he said it, it's like an alcoholic who reaches that point in the 12 steps where you kind of go I'm not going to make any resolves anymore. I am letting go completely. I need help from beyond myself. And really that's more, if there's a point that marks his real turning to Christ for mercy to do for him what he could not do for himself, that's the point. Mm -hmm. And that's where he said, it's like his conscience was relieved and his illness, uh, his fever began to recede. And he would kind of mark that as the beginning of his real sort of faith in Christ. Uh, but, it's a long journey. He doesn't really have any other Christian friends. He's starting to read his Bible and he will make three voyages as captain of a slave ship. And it's painful during this period, like two tectonic plates kind of overlapping. We can feel the, the, the tension that he is a, a captain of a slave ship. And even though he's not the worst of the slave captains and he there's, thinks there's of no, himself being a, yeah, there's no good know, stories. Yeah. Yeah, there's no good stories. He is he is complicit in the system. He is, um, you know, people are dying on his watch. He is imprisoning and transporting, you know, forced migration, hundreds of slaves, um, while taking his first steps to try to place his faith in Christ, while reading his Bible, recording in his diary. He has, we have a, a, his captain's log, and we have his spiritual diary during this period. Mm -hmm. and he does not yet see the inconsistency between the two and we could talk more about that but that's the probably that's the most painful part of the book for the reader to read and to you know we are aware that that's a point where some readers might give up and just say i can't you know thank this, you you know what is, uh, honestly yeah. when i was when i was at that part of the book i'm thinking bruce don't like we're like we're three quarters through you can't leave us here like this is this mm -hmm. can't be the end of the story you know yeah. and i was i was i gotta say i was getting a little anxious this, yeah, okay. Uh, you okay. know, so, so it's, it's interesting that you would pick yeah. that up. I was getting anxious because it didn't look yeah. like there's enough yeah. pages to resolve this. Because, of course, we all want everything resolved. I know. Yeah. But we wanted the reader to feel, to feel it and to feel um, like it's so tempting to interject commentary, right? But we weren't doing that. We wanted them to see Newton's eyes closed and to see them open, in a sense, when they open. And for me, it makes it all the more poignant when, um, I mean, just to jump ahead for a minute, when he's, you know, I'm in my 60s, when in his 60s, he begins to realize the full impact of what he had done in his 20s. Yeah. And he has to let that register. And so when he's a minister in London, he's, he was in this market town of Olney, and then in London, I should just say he left the slave trade in 1754. And... Uh, and he begins to move in circles where there is some anti-slavery sentiment. And there are signs that he began to realize, is slowly realizing. But he doesn't say anything publicly about this until later. And we tried to indicate and drop the little breadcrumbs that show yeah. that he's with the rest of kind of, you know, Britain. Um, and well, there's a longer story well, there. But at, yeah. at one point, as he's, um, as he's still a slaver, 
Um, and his faith is becoming something that he's speaking quite, you know, and, he, and he's coming back from these successful trips where he's losing less people than other slavers. And he's coming yeah. back and doing, it, it looks like through the book, almost like church tours where he's going and telling a story and people are applauding the, the goodness of God and the favor on this particular slaver who's who's having wonderful success, yay Jesus. Um, mm-hmm, because, mm-hmm. you know, rather than, so it, yeah, the blindness to the inconsistency is shocking. Um, yeah. and, and again, it, it's, makes, it was, it was, it was yeah. anxiety <laughs> rising for me. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Liverpool is that kind of a city and that's where he was coming back into port there and where, you know, you could put an, a notice up, you know, giving thanks to God that, you know, for the success of the voyage and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And, um, and uh, um, so he leaves the slave trade. He is uh, working in the sort of civil service and the uh, custom service for a while and becomes self-taught. And this is where he really begins to be connected to, to you know, people like John Wesley and George Whitfield and people that are involved in the revival and mm. in, in serious kind of um, uh, spirituality and faith. And his faith is really growing. He's learning. So then this and is kind of wants, the, this is that like the beginning is it not of of what we would now call evangelicalism is that like right at the yeah. right yeah. yeah these are yeah. the early early days yeah. right okay yeah so what they call the great awakening in America or the evangelical yeah. revival and um, this is um, you know uh, they would talk about people becoming awakened to a real faith in Christ being a real rather than a nominal Christian and in that world he's his faith comes alive and he is educated. He is teaching himself Greek and Hebrew and even mm. Syriac for, for yeah, I can't mm. believe he learned Syriac. And he uh, he wants to be able to tell people, other people, you know, for them to find the grace and the mercy that he found. And he genuinely is learning about and, and wanting to, to be useful as a Christian. He is ordained in the Church of England, 1764. And um, I think it's about 40 years of age. And he begins a, a lifetime of ministry. And and he genuinely uh, sort of sees awakening. He sees people coming to Christ. He, a 19th century secular historian, described him as one of the best parish priests in England. Like hmm. he was a, a really effective pastor. He knew people's hearts. He, um, he knew how to minister to sin-sick souls that were broken. He knew how to walk with people. He was an effective preacher. He was a, an incredible spiritual counselor. And uh, I've read thousands of his letters of spiritual counsel and advice. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he became a real um, gentle a man, a transformed man. His character was, was changed. He walked softly, um, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorite quotations late yeah. in his life. So to come back to the, um, in a sense, the, the kind of inclusio, you have the slave trade years, you have him involved in ministry, and there's signs of anti-slavery sentiment in the 1760s, in the 70s, in the 80s. But it's really when he moves to London and is involved in metropolitan circles and with William Wilberforce and other people, and when there's a certain amount of anti-slavery agitation that is breaking the surface, that he realizes he needs to come out publicly. Mm-hmm. And he also needs to feel the impact of what mm-hmm. he had done and to make a public confession. And that for me, revisiting the story and the archives, that for me is some of the most moving uh, material uh, in the book. And um, is where in his 60s, he has to reckon with this. Yeah. And it's at the same time that his wife is dying. Yeah, we didn't and mention he, that he did get the girl. He did get Polly. Like, yeah, they sorry. Did, yeah, yes, he did yeah. get the girl. Yeah. 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 And uh, and it was one of the good marriages of the 18th century. Um, right. Some people called John Wesley's marriage the 30 years war, but uh, this one, <laughs> this was a good marriage um, and a very loving marriage. Yeah. Um, they couldn't have children, but they did sort of take in two nieces and yeah. uh, cared for them. Um, so, um, so he realizes he needs to speak out. He needs to be a part of destroying the system that he had been involved in. And I think this is very moving, not like when, you know, the, the God's grace in Christ is genuinely changing him, is making him a different person. But what does it mean that there can be things written across our lives in letters too large to read? What does it mean when majorities, like it, it, it frightened me, frightens me to think of the extent to which 
what sociologists call a plausibility structure when yeah. majorities accept something yeah what you know what we can be complicit in and you wonder like they say about you know um uh you know in terms of human rights and in terms of crimes against humanity that term came into you know 20th century uh, legal discourse meaning there are some things you can't not know and right. you can't use the excuse that well it was just my job or i was just following orders there are some things that you can't not know and yet the extent to which we can be blind and we can be complicit is a bit shocking and newton said um in this later period he said custom example yeah and interest, and interest. had blinded yeah. my eyes you that know? you know what that that really grabbed me because i've been thinking a lot even about i mean this is this could be a whole other podcast but you, you know think about truth and reconciliation in canada yeah. yeah and the horrific things that people um not that long ago did to other human beings yeah. as christians um and even the fact that it, in it, it's it's I, I i can't really see the the church in yeah. general um Honestly, taking on um, sort of reconciliation in a in a in a in a big way, it's it's quite easy to sort of say, "Well, that was them, it's a big deal." Yeah. I don't really I don't really need to know that my life has uh, has has been um, as it is because of the legacy of someone else's cruelty to another human being. Yeah, so yeah, yeah it's it's yeah. not. I'm, I'm I'm as I'm reading, I'm seeing, I'm going ding 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 ding, check check yeah, check yeah. check. I just see yeah. this all the time. Yeah, and that's we Craig and I. Um, in fact, I didn't understand it at first when Craig talked this language, but we wanted to write it as a parable. So yep. you could read this story and, and the reader is asking, um, where am I blind? What is it that I might yeah. be complicit in? And I think you're right, Steve, like we have an obligation. Our first obligation as Christians is to tell the truth. Tell the truth. And we need, we need to tell the truth about the past. And Craig and I, when we were storyboarding and talking about telling the story, I said, Craig, I want to go between sort of statue toppling cancel culture and whitewashing we right. have to go because in the middle is simply telling the truth we simply yeah. need to tell the truth and that's all you need to do is tell the truth and um and i think there's so much redemptive in realizing okay the iniquity of the slave system what newton was involved in and then seeing him change but not right away and then when he does see it he then acts and he seeks to destroy the system that he was a part of. Right. He wrote one of the most important pieces of anti-slavery literature that was given to every member of parliament. He made a public confession. He encouraged Wilberforce. He gave evidence to the Privy Council. And he was a trusted figure as a, as a respectable London clergyman that when he spoke about the slave trade, they, he wasn't inclined to be written off as somebody like right. he, he, his testimony was effective and he gave evidence to a house select committee and there's no question in my mind i mean you can't do sort of counterfactual history but if newton hadn't done that i think it's reasonable to think that abolition might have been delayed you know for another generation yeah he what i found also fascinating but even as he started to 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 question um, the morality of the slave trade, it seems at first what bothered him was the the um, the ill treatment of slaves, not slavery itself. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So at first, yeah. it's like the the problem is you can't you can't do the transatlantic sort of thing without suffer yeah. without people suffering. So therefore, it's horrific. But it, it yeah. took a while before he says no slavery itself it is wrong. Yeah. It just yeah. so and, and so you just again I, I found it fascinating. So it's decades. Of his coming awake, his awakening is decades yeah. and decades. Yeah. And meanwhile, he's a good neighbor. He's a good husband. Um, yeah. he, you know, like he's 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 showing signs of being a a, a repentant good person. And yeah. it just yeah. so yeah, it's just it's frustrating because you really want the blinding light to come down and and everybody yeah. to see clearly, and it doesn't yeah. seem to work that way, does it? No, in fact. Um, you know, this is the kind of a book where we're telling the story and just telling the story. And I wish I could, you know, insert like um, all the literature on abolition and anti-slavery and, and so on. But if you read that literature, you don't have to read very far in like Christopher Leslie Brown's Moral Capital on the History of Anti-Slavery. Mm -hmm. When you realize that for us, the question is why, why didn't they know sooner? 
and act sooner. Right. When you read this literature, the question is, why did they act at all? Because slavery has been such a universal, universally accepted thing. It's been, it, it was so deeply ingrained. The question is more for historians, why was Britain exceptional at this point and why and how did things get wired together in terms of some of the Enlightenment philosophers, the evangelicals, the Quaker, the anti-sentiment, yeah. the opportunity to break the surface and to make a difference? Like for us, it's just like we kind of go, well, why didn't it happen sooner? But a lot of historians are going, I think the question is, why did anti-slavery anti -slavery sentiment take root? Why was abolition of the slave trade and then slavery, why was it like, how did this come to be? Because it actually is exceptional that it did. And the very success of it is why today we, you know, th that we, we would look back and, and have the feelings that we do is because they were so successful. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I read a, a kind of global history of slavery, um, you know, as a part of getting my head back into all of this. And it's just horrific, Steve, like this has been you know, and when you look at the Muslim slave trade, when you look at the medieval slave trade, there's still uh, uh, hereditary race-based slavery in Mauritania today in West Africa. A million people in hereditary slavery there. You look at Darfur, you look at all sorts of areas of the world today, and the continuation of slavery and sex trafficking and race-based slavery and labor-based slavery. And one of the dangers of historicizing, as we say, the Atlantic slave trade and only thinking of slavery in those terms is we fail to see that it's been uh, not only universal, all but universal in the past, but it's actually happening now. It's right. happening now. And we need the Wilberforces and people today who identify this and speak out against it. And thankfully there are people and there are really good organizations that are doing that, but it's, um, it's happening now. Uh, you know, but I, I I look back at um, you know when he talks about this this um, custom example interest, mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. that it's it's hard to see if it's if if it's custom if there's example people we like people we know that are saying well it's not as bad as you think or or whatever and mm -hmm. then the fact that it's in our in for for especially for those of us who are privileged people it's in our interest not to challenge these these things too deeply. And in our um, economic interest. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. And so yeah. it's, yeah. So it, it seems to me, okay, I want to ask you something here. So then what is the secret sauce? Like, why did it happen? I mean, would you credit, um, uh, I don't want to, this could be a whole other podcast, but would you credit evangelicalism for this? Like, <laughs> do, 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 I, what do you know what I'm getting at here? Because I guess, yeah, I guess no, what I I'm, I'm the I, question I'm, is, what's the difference is. between evangelicalism then and now? Um, but I, I don't want to get too much into the now, but is there a way we can just at least ask that question? Absolutely. I think um, yeah, for historians, it, you know, again, telling the truth means being particular and exact about what happened. And I think um, there's a certain element of, um, I'm going to use the word contingency, which means um, things could have been otherwise. And the reason why it did happen, there were a number of things that came together at the right moment. And one of them is anti-slavery sentiment, for which evangelicals were hugely important in, in growing anti-slavery sentiment and uh, enlightenment humanitarianism the actions of Quakers, all of that, but that wasn't enough. There also was um, a certain sense that um, uh, the, the, after the uh, American Revolution and the loss of colonies and the debates that went on there, something broke the surface politically where it became uh, political oh. and political to act. Because how could American patriots claim to be protesting against British tyranny and arguing for freedom when they had slaves. Right. And when the British complained about that, then their hypocrisy was revealed in the fact that they're still supporting a slave system. So all of a sudden the issue became political and there are other factors like that, that made this the moment to act where it was sort of um, to do with British self image to do with uh, what this one historian calls moral capital right. and, um, and opportunities to use public opinion as never for to before to bring pressure on parliament and then it's the actions of i always want to al also say it's the actions of individuals it mattered that there was a wilberforce it mattered that there was a granville sharp it mattered that yeah. there was a john newton the people that were willing to act and to speak out 
So, uh, but one of the elements in there, and this comes out a little bit in the book, I think, in some of William Cooper's poems that we we speak to, is the the recognition, and this was there in evangelical conviction, the recognition that we are all universally in Adam. And, uh, uh, you know, monogenesis, we all derive from a common ancestor, we are all a sort of common humanity, and a common humanity in Christ, and that Christ died for all. And these sentiments uh, were definitely hugely important. So Newton's friend, the poet William Cooper, who asked Newton to write the preface Gosh. for the volume, yeah. 1782, this is very early, um, speaks forcefully and theologically for the kinds of things that we would say today would be the basis of universal human rights. But it's because of Christ. It's because we are, you know, and... But then it's the powerful message that uh, also grace is universal. And the idea that we are all in Adam, but we are all universally offered grace. And so these kinds of sentiments went to work. And they should animate us today as they as they did then. I have to tell you, when we were doing the, I think we talked about this a bit earlier privately, Steve, but when we're doing some of the filming for the uh, the documentary, one of the most moving moments for me were we're in John Newton's church in Olney, where he wrote Amazing Grace. We're in the actual church, and there's the pulpit where the former slave trader had introduced the hymn Amazing Grace for his congregation. And under that pulpit at the front of the church, uh, the Kingdom Choir, I think probably the second most famous gospel choir in the world after the Soweto Gospel Choir, this is... Um, this is the gospel choir that sang at Harry and Meghan's wedding. They, um, the gospel choir is Afro-British, Afro-Caribbean singers with such incredible joy and freedom who have owned Amazing Grace as a black standard, a gospel, um, spiritual. They are singing this as their own song and to realize that this message of grace that the human condition that we all need mercy we all need grace that this is so universal that the sprinkled blood speaks a better word than the blood of abel and it's not ultimately a recrimination and bitterness and revenge but it's uh but there's a path forward there that mm. i think um you know comes through in that moment um and um for me that was a very powerful moment a lot of the film crew that were there filming you couldn't see a dry eye. Just, um, it's just wonderful. Jeez. Just the joy of it. Yeah, yeah. You know? My goodness, yeah. <laughs> so, when is that film coming out? What is that documentary going to be ready? I think probably first quarter of next year, in maybe okay. uh, sort of January, February next year. Yeah. And des describe that to us. Describe like what what's in the. Is it yeah. sort of a, a summation of the book? What or is it a different thing than the book? Or it, it's uh, same people involved. And yeah. uh, Craig and I were uh, co writers on the script with the director Ruben Evans. And it, the backbone of it as a documentary is a paper, uh, academic paper I gave last year on the anniversary um, in the UK. And so it it talks. It's John Newton's story. But it, the story behind the song, but it's also more the story of Amazing Grace itself, and it's a story of the yeah. um, of the music and the song, which has its own biography and its own history. Yeah, and um, you know, from the time of John Newton forward, and there's a lot of um, uh, reenactments. So it isn't just narrative, sort of straight to camera narrative. There's a lot of reenactments of the story, and there's some tremendous people who've been involved. Probably the most famous actor involved is John Rhys Davies, who was in Lord of the Rings and other movies. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful we had him do the reenactments of the old John Newton, where this really powerfully emotional material we've talked about, where in his in his 60s and 70s, he's reckoning with his 20s. And it's John Rhys Davies, who's, um, uh, I'm narrating some of the story, but John Rhys Davies as the old John Newton is also narrating some of the story. And um, and I think uh, having a, a a really strong actor like that really makes um, makes it come alive. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. Yeah, the song itself. I was I was I, I just did. Um, uh, it, it's it's I was I was at a funeral a couple of years back for um, it was a it was a, a, a Winnipeg based comedian who was known for his shock. Um, comedy is like very yeah, extremely yeah. crude very very famous yeah, yeah. um uh and i i love the guy um but <laughs> he was a complicated uh fellow and the funeral took place in a in a in a 
in an evangelical church because that was the the, the yeah. church that was big enough for this yeah. guy's fan base. But there was there was no, <laughs> there was nothing about it that came off as sort of Christian or pious. It was a it was the rudest the yeah. rudest um, uh, funeral I've ever been to in my life. And I really had I was quite amazed by the pastor who sat there and just sort of allowed them to yeah, yeah. do it the way they wanted to do it. Um, and I remember just sort of thinking throughout the thing. I mean, I love these people, and and um, and I wish we could do something that could kind of bring our voices together in some way yeah, that that, yeah, that was yeah. not just sort of rehearsing all this other yeah. stuff. They sang "Amazing Grace." Isn't that something? You know, and I just That's remember something. all of a sudden there's you know a thousand people. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and all of a sudden that song comes on, and somehow that song. Was yeah. okay, and these are again very yeah. irreverent, probably yeah. mostly anti-Christian. Yeah. Um, the the uh, I was reading about Amazing Grace. The poem is I read this is interesting. Unashamedly middle brow written for a low brow congregation. Only twenty one of the one hundred and fifty words have more than one syllable. It's exactly it's it's for all of us. It's not it mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. even the fact that it doesn't say overtly mention Christ. Mm-hmm. You know the 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 uh, the hero of the song is Grace. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, and so uh, almost anybody can probably find a way to connect to an experience where they have received or given that in some yeah. way. So it, it's kind of a miracle song. I can't like. I know. I'd be. I'd like to ask you more about the music in a minute. I, but I think I've been asked a lot of times about why this song has gone so wide and also emotionally so deep that when people face inconsolable loss. Mm-hmm. When life is at its very worst, including national tragedies from 9-11 to a space shuttle uh, disaster, Challenger, mm-hmm. to Oklahoma City bombing, to school shootings, people gather, hold hands, and sing Amazing Grace, a song which thanks God for what he has done for us. And Grace, John Newton met it as a metonym, which means it stands for the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. But people sing it as a personification. I sing, I, I think it's become a prayer for grace and a recognition yeah. that when life is inconsolable, we realize that the human condition, where are we? Like you sing about, we could use a little mercy now, like the human condition. Right. We are all desperately in need of mercy. And we there's something about acknowledging that. There are some 20th century hymn book editors that were embarrassed by the word wretch. And they tried to replace it with that saved and strengthened me or that saved someone like me. Yeah. But when life is really wretched, you want to acknowledge it. You want to be able to speak the truth and say, sometimes life goes completely sideways. Yeah. We don't know which end is up and it's wretched. Yeah. And we stand in need of grace. But Steve, why do you think, um, like I've talked about this beyond what I know, because I'm, I'm not anything like a musicologist, but yeah. the the magic of the words and the music together. And so there's something, everybody knows there's something magic that happens when, you know, the words and the music come together. And there's something about the music that is making this song also universal. It is an old shape note melody from the South. Yeah. It's the pentatonic scale, which yeah. is sort of basic to roots music and so on. But what is there something about the music that you think has made this a more universal song? Well, yeah, I, th- I, th- I think for one, like, I mean, it's it's a simple melody, but it covers a wide range, right, you know? Right. So it's not a simple melody that sticks to, you know, here's home bass and it only kind of, you know, goes a couple notes yeah, up. Yeah, and we yeah. have those kinds of songs. Yeah, there's yeah. A, there's um, It's a simple melody. It's easy to sing. A child, you don't, you know, it's... um. You know, it's not asking too much of us, but the range is quite ri- wide. You know, yeah, from yeah, from yeah, the highest yeah. notes to the lowest notes, and it and it that saved a oh, wretch like me, like that that whole sort of plaintive opens you up, know, yeah. s- sort of opens up. You know, uh, once yeah. was lost, but now I am found. So so it kind of yeah. it has yeah. hope and it has hills and valleys and and um, uh, but it's so accessible. Uh, I, I mean, I'm I mean, I'm not a I don't have sort of the uh, the musical knowledge. I'm just kind of a hack that got kind of good or good enough kind of thing. So I can't really speak to it um, that sense. But there's just again, there's um there's plaintiveness. The word wretch I think is really important. Yeah, yeah you know. Yeah. So it's the words too, right? But yeah, wretch, yeah. wretch, just yeah. the way it sounds, yeah. you know, rather yeah. than saying yeah. sinner, right? There's yeah. a there's something very guttural about it. 
And I wonder if there is a simplicity, like the words and the music, there's a simplicity that allows yeah. for a range of interpretation. In the original, the tune was carried in the alto, in the middle, oh. um, and uh, but there's so many versions and arrangements now, and some of the, um, listening to Mahalia Jackson, or mm. just last night with the, uh, some of my kids, we were listening to the amazing sort of 10 minute long Aretha Franklin version in 1972 that's oh, come yeah. out now. And I was, when I was speaking in the UK about this, a black poet, um, you know, stopped me and said, Bruce, because I, I just sort of said something, you know, being trying to be a bit humorous about how, you know, it took Mahalia Jackson five minutes to warm up in the first syllable. And she said, mm -hmm. no, she said, that's really important. She said that melisma, that, that slowness is because we're free and we have all the time in the world hmm. and we can, we can, we can take our, so the 10 minute version by Aretha Franklin yeah. and where she's riffing again and again on through many dangers, toils and snares. And you can see the, the whole, you know, congregation getting to its feet. And, and, and I just keep thinking of um, this poet who said it's because we're free and we can, we take all the time in the world. Mm. And um, and the the very paradox of this being something that John Newton wrote that is being owned like that, I just think is that's the reconciliation, the grace, the future that we hope for. You know. Yeah, I think also with with the with the lyric itself, like there's a simplicity in the melody and there's a simplicity in yeah. the lyric for sure. So it leaves no one behind. Right. Uh, right. But like any good piece of art, and and it is art. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, you know, that there's like the, you know, it's like an iceberg where the, 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 the biggest part is, is by far is below the right. surface. Right. And, right. and so that, that there's something very honest about the song. Right. Like he's, he's referencing this life that yeah. was wretched. He's not just, yeah. you know, he's not sort of saying your wretched life, Jesus is yeah, going to yeah, yeah. save you from. Yeah, he's yeah, not yeah. telling you your story. He's telling you his story and you believe him. Like there's just yeah. enough there that even if you didn't know the story, You'd yeah. kind of go. I bet there's. I bet you there's a story. You can yeah. feel that. There's yeah. a nice bit of the iceberg too, underneath the water that a lot of people wouldn't know is that um, when Newton wrote it, he in the first instance, I mean, like you say, it's got layers, right? Yeah. But in the first instance, he's thinking of King David in the Old Testament because <laughs> uh, it's a murderous and adulterous king with a past, right? Who uh, should not have been a part of God's story. Yeah, and uh, the prophet Nathan comes to him when Nathan said he wanted to build when when David said he wanted to build a house for God a temple, mm -hmm. and Nathan says God says you're not going to build my house I'm going to build your house I'm going to build your dynasty, and David responds First Chronicles seventeen sixteen yeah. and seventeen, saying Who am I that you've spoken of the past you've spoken of the future, and Newton's interpretation of that is Amazing Grace how sweet the sound so. In terms of there being layers underneath it, you've got this kind of biblical resonance. You've mm. got Newton's own story, and it sort of presses out into something, um, you know, universal. And yeah. so even, like you say, it doesn't, I don't think it even uses the word God until that famous fourth stanza that Newton didn't write. Um, so it, <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. it can be sung by anybody. It could be sung by anybody. Because it speaks to this universality, right? Yeah. yeah. You know what? Uh, here's where it gets a little personal for me, um, is I yeah. have a, a mentor, a, a, a profound man in my life when I was a young man um, in my late teens then into my early uh, 20s. And it just had a deep impact on my life. And yeah. when he died, he had a, he had a story. And, um, and I, I remember saying, can I have the rights to your story? Can I, can I tell it? And he goes, no. And I said, why not? And he says, because I don't, he says, um, nobody wants to hear the whole truth and I don't have heart to tell half of it. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that, like, it, it's, it was a kind of a staggering statement, you know, and I didn't really know what was behind it. About a month ago, um, he's been dead now for a couple of years, he came on a list of, of, um, of um, Boston, sex, yeah. sexual uh, predators. Uh -huh. And so, uh, so there was a deep past there, um, yeah. and it I was rocked by it, right? Because this man um, <laughs> was a powerfully good influence on my life. Yeah. I, we, we would not, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. I wouldn't be, had the career that I had in, um, if it wasn't for this man. And yet there was this, there was this darkness to his life. Um, and I've been sort of, 
I've been sort of rocked by that. What does it mean and how do I deal with it and how do I interpret my history? And, and it's like dropping, you know, ink into a cup and all your memories get stained. Um, oh, what a picture, you know, it's, Steve. Yeah. And so, but reading this through twice in the last month and a half, oh, I'm going to try not to cry. In the back of my mind is my buddy. Yeah. The guy who did horrible things, um, who yeah. hurt people. And, um, and there's no, there's, you, there's no going around it or like yeah. it's yeah. that happened, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and the sadness for me to some degree that in his lifetime, he didn't get to, uh, didn't have the courage to, didn't have the opportunity, whatever the thing is, didn't get to do what, in a sense, what Newton did. Yeah. Um, and, 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 but the book really helps me, um, reclaim the, the some of the story that yeah. it's 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 okay to say that some of it's good still yeah <laughs> you know yeah. and that i can still pray for my buddy um um and 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 love him and be grateful for his life and and realize that that redemption grace is um well depending on what side of the story from is almost offensive um yeah. it's it's almost immoral um, yeah. You know that people yeah. can do these wicked things, and yet God yeah. um, has a different view, without excusing those horrible things. I'm 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 kind yeah. of just babbling here, but no, know. no, it's that's deeply moving, Steve. And uh, to try to hang on to the good that the good is good, and uh, but the human can to reckon with the human condition, all the way to the bottom. Yeah. Is to realize our need for grace and mercy. You know, I've been reading through the big, like a thousand page, like the full Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn. And, um, mm. and I came to the chapter on the blue caps, which were the sort of middle management, uh, extrajudicial people who really committed a lot of the atrocities and mm -hmm. uh, just awful stuff. Yeah. And that's the, the chapter in which Solzhenitsyn says, the line that divides good and evil is not a line that runs between political parties, it's not a line that runs between nations, not a line that runs between people, but through every human heart. Yeah. And I thought, okay, that's the famous line, you hear people quote that, but, but where it occurs is him talking about um, how if things had been just a little bit different in his life, mm -hmm. if he had compromised just a little bit here or there, if his education had been different, he says he might have been one of those blue caps. Right. He might have been one of those people. And if there's anybody in the world that could have divided the world into two kinds of people, oppressors and victims, mm -hmm. and he was the victim, and they were the oppressors. But at that moment, like, and it's, it, it's after a nauseating, horrific account, like waves crashing on the sea over and over again of the atrocities and the evils and the torture and the abuse. Mm -hmm. And then he says that, and instead of saying, I'm the victim, they're the oppressor. He says, that could have been me. Mm -hmm. I could have been that person. And that's kind of how I read John Newton's story as I kind of go, um, this is me. I, uh, yeah. I, I'm the human condition. It, we, we need repentance. Mm -hmm. We need to, we need to make a difference. When we see the truth, we need to act. But the human condition is such that it needs to be reckoned with at its, at its deepest level universally as uh that we need we need grace from each other yeah. uh we need grace from christ and we need the grace that changes us you know that changes us too right yeah yeah, yeah it doesn't leave us there yeah no yeah 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 oh my goodness yeah i think that's uh, the, the, the word itself is um is a, uh, i mean i think maybe that's part of the appeal of the song too is that that i think none of us really know what it means <laughs> yeah. uh, we get we get glimmers of it so it's a it's a it's a mystery um that can't be sort of in a sense uh, conquered yeah um yeah. and wrestled down into into this or that and so there's something about it that's um to some degree offensive but but it's also yeah. just so hopeful um yeah yeah it's so profoundly yeah. hopeful right yeah hey listen yeah. um i we've I could talk. I'd like to come back and have about three more podcasts because there's so many things I'd love to talk about that come out of this book. Um, in terms of like, how do you, um, how do how, how do you lay this over our contemporary life? This story, like, what does that look like for you? What do you you see that? Um, but maybe that's another time. I'd like to talk about evangelicalism yeah. and what that means in our day mm -hmm. because it's a it's a it's a it's a complicated 
label now. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and maybe maybe it's always been. Um, there's, um, but I, I was thinking I was I was gonna I always have a song at the end um, mm -hmm. uh, of, of my podcast, and we talked about how um, "Mercy Now" would be a really good song, but that's a Mary Gothy uh, song, and I'm not sure I could get permission for it. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is, uh, for the way out, I'm going to play a little lyric video of a song that you know, um, mm -hmm. that I wrote when we did a chorus together, um, Come to My Help, mm -hmm. O God, which is Psalm 70, verse 1. And the psalm is, uh, the verse is sung in the minor key and the major key. And the minor key sort of, um, it's sung, you know, in that place where we ask for mercy from God, come help uh, when things are dark, uh, when we're down. Uh, but is it Cassian, right? Uh, third century. Yeah, John Cassian in the, yeah. uh, in the third, fourth century. <laughs> Who said yeah. we need this as much when times are good, maybe if not more, like don't kid yourself. Yeah. And it was it was yeah. after John Newton, in a sense, got the love of his life, got a respectable life, became a respected minister, uh, profound pastor. Then he started recognizing or reckoning the deeper sin that he had been yeah. um and so, it, like our lives are such that, um, yeah, there are times when the darkness is just is just evident, um, and we call for help on God. Um, but let's not kid ourselves. Like, yeah. <laughs> when light yeah. comes, things get exposed that we just probably couldn't even see coming. That's what my dad used to say to me growing up. My dad passed away a couple of years ago, and um, but he used to say to me, Bruce, the closer you get to the light, the more impurities show up. You know, yeah, yeah, and it takes it takes courage to keep mm. walking towards the light and let that happen. But yeah, that song that uh, you know that uh, John Cassian said, you can pray this uh, at any time when times yep. are good. You 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 you're grateful you have such a savior, uh, but you realize you still stand in need of mercy. And uh, and and when times are desperate, it's a cry for mercy. And it's so appropriate, Steve, because that of course is King David again. Yep. And um, David recognizing in Psalm 70, and the whole of Psalm 70 makes the cameo appearance in Psalm 40. So it's mm -hmm. it's there, you know, it's yeah. uh, it's it's the psalmist cry that we can all pray. Uh, there is no condition in which I don't say, oh, God, make speed to save us, oh, Lord, make haste to help us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, viewers, listeners, um, again, this is uh, we've been talking about Amazing Grace, um, the life of John Newton, and the surprising story behind a song by Bruce Hindmarsh and Craig, how do you say the last name? Borlaise. Borlaise. It's a, it's, <laughs> it's a great read. Just, it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a fun read um, by, on its own. Um, but I think, I think there's something very important for this particular day. So um, I'll have shown in the show notes, there'll be links to the book and links to, as, as soon as you get that documentary up, we'll make sure that that gets put in there as well. And uh, thanks, Bruce. It's always lovely. Thank you, Steve. Chatting with you. And you. Lord, hurry to my rescue. Come to my help, O oh God. Lord, hurry to my rescue. Come to my help, O oh God. Lord, hurry to my rescue. Come to my help, O oh God. Lord, hurry to my rescue. Come to my help, O oh God. Lord, hurry to my rescue. Come to my help, O oh God. Lord, hurry to my rescue. Come to my help, O oh God. Lord, hurry to my rescue. Come to my help, O oh God. Lord, hurry to my rescue. help, O oh God, Lord, hurry to my rescue. Come to my help, O oh God, Lord, hurry to my rescue. 
Come to my help, O oh God, Lord, hurry to my rescue. Come to my help, O oh God, Lord, hurry.